Well, thanks for being here. This is a continuation of the deep learning saga, our H2O world this year. Um, there's a lot of stuff for deep learning. I'm sure many of you have run deep learning before, um, and you probably saw that there were a lot of options, a lot of checkboxes that you didn't quite know what to put in. But uh, this talk is aimed at helping you with that. This is basically enterprise proven um, rules to make you successful, okay? That's the idea. It's not, not necessarily all the tricks, but if you follow these 13 tricks, you will know that you did pretty much your best you could do with this tool. And once you do all these, and you probably will figure out a couple more on your own because you'll get so experienced with the tool. So let's start with tip number one. Understand the model complexity. What is a deep learning model at all? It's an artificial neural net. That's what it is for us at H2O. We don't have these complicated um, recurrent or recursive neural nets. This is just straight uh, old school, um, fully connected, feed forward neural nets, which means each layer of numbers uh, feeds into the next layer of numbers, okay? And the leftmost side has features that are coming in, like age and income and FICO score. In this case, it's all numeric features. Um, but, but if the other feature was how many um, like different animals you have or something, then that's a number as well. But if the animals actually come in as cat, dog, mouse, for example, then you would have three more neurons, one that sees cats, one that sees dogs, one that sees mice. And each one would get a zero or a one based on whether the animal is a cat or a dog or a mouse, okay? That's the rough idea there. Um, so you have numbers coming in, you have numbers propagating through the systems based on those connections. These connections are the weights, the weights are the things that are being learned by the model. The, the weights are the, the model itself. The collection of weights basically, plus the knowledge of some parameters like the, which non-linearities are applied um, on each layer, because you don't just take these numbers into the neurons and add them up with that weight each, but you also transform that number that comes out. So each neuron transforms its input into its own output that it then propagates to the next layer. And the knowledge of that um, nonlinearity is also required to describe this model. So a set of weights plus the nonlinearities pretty much is all you need to make the predictions. And at the very end, on the other side, there will be some numbers coming out, and you can turn these into probabilities with a so-called softmax function. It's just some rescaling to map all the output numbers back into zero, one space. But in the end, you get a probability for fraud and a probability for not fraud, which in this case is one minus probability for fraud because it's either or, okay? So it's a simple model. And uh, as you can imagine, all these weights, that's a bunch of numbers, those dense linear algebra, that's a matrix vector multiplication that happens for each training row that comes in. And it also has to fix those weights on the way back, which means it's another update over all the weights. So it's another intensive operation that costs uh, CPU time. So what you have to take away here is that it's CPU intense. And this model, in this case, will be described as the 4-3 model. Four in the first hidden um, layer and three in the second. And what are we talking about? Well, the neurons, the number of connections. Um, the, the actually, the, the paths through which it has to go, right? Each neuron is basically a site through which the information flows. So nodes, we call them in this graph. So four hidden neurons in the first layer and three in the second. And you can specify this array of numbers. You can say 50, 50, 50, and then you have three layers of 50 neurons. All right, now that you know this, um, you can also imagine, of course, that every time you run it, it trains and the numbers change. You can stop at any time. You can continue training more and so on. So the model is just a set of numbers, and whatever they are, that's what they are. You don't have to um, know that they're good or bad or anything. Now, the question is, how does um, your data affect the model itself? Like a random forest, if you have a lot of complicated features, the random forest, for example, has to grow deeper trees, more trees to get better, so your model complexity grows with the data. How does the model complexity grow with the data here? So let's say you get 10 billion rows. I give you 10 billion rows and 1,111 columns. This is the bool, right, moment, so we have to think about ones and zeros here. Um, 1,110 of those are predictor columns. One is a response column. Now, we have 1,100 numerical columns and 10 categoricals with 400 levels each. Something like a zip code or an animal type or a, a cover type or whatever. Just imagine some categoricals. Now, 
given that data and my two models down there, which one is the more complex model? So now we have a model with four layers of 400 neurons, and we have another model with one layer that has 500 neurons. So who thinks that number one is more complex? Who thinks number two is more complex? All right. Let's see who's right. Actually, number two. The problem is that those 10 categorical columns out of 1,100, right, the, the 10 at the very end, let's say, those each have 400 factor levels, just like cat, dog, mouse. So now you have 4,000 more input neurons in your system that have to be fed with those zeros and ones. And those 4,000 add to the other 1,100, which means you get 5,100 input neurons. So your first layer is really big. Just to feed in the data, it has to be made numerical. So now the 5,100 numbers all talk to all the other neurons in the second layer. So now if that number is 400, you get 5,100 times 400. In the other case, you get 5,100 times 500. And that little difference is all that matters. That makes the bulk of the model, that input layer. It doesn't matter how many layers you stack at the end, almost, because they're only 400 by 400, which is small compared to the 5,100 times 400 in the beginning, right? So now you see that they're pretty much the same complexity, but one hidden layer is as complex as the one with four. And you can imagine the first one with the four layers will be smarter at coming up with nonlinearities and interactions, whereas the second one will be slightly sharper in vision, if you want, to see those features. So it's not necessarily clear which one is going to be better. But that's the model complexity. Now the next question I already answered almost. I said, how much does this uh, model take in memory when you try to run this model on a 10 billion row data set? You think, oh my god, I need a Hadoop cluster for that. I need more memory. I need to do XMX 100G on each node to fit that big model. No. The model is 2.5 million weights times 4 bytes per float, right? It's all floating point numbers. So that's not much. It's 10 megabytes. There's a little bit of an overhead to do the learning rate, the momentum, and all that. These are terms per weight because we do adaptive training. Um, so it means roughly 30 megabytes, OK? Times 3 is a safe estimate. So your model is only 30 megabytes, which means you don't need to do any XMX 500G or whatever just to fit that model. The data is what has to fit in your cluster, not the model. The model is small. And the model does not change in size either, because you pass over it many times. The numbers get better, but the numbers don't get more. OK, does that make sense? So now that we have our model, we understand the complexity. We try to limit the input, which I'll discuss later how we can do that. Let's say we have a model that's somewhat um, reasonable in terms of what comes into it. The, the features are not too many. Now, what I would do first, I would run the other algorithms. Because you can't just run deep learning out of the box and say, let's see what happens. Unless you're kind of a risk taker. I will do it sometimes, but I really don't like that feeling of not knowing where I stand. So I will run GBM, GLM, Random Forest, since H2O offers all those as well, the same kind of environment, you just run them all. And GLM will be really fast. Random Forest will be um, fast because it samples columns. GBM can take longer if it has many, many columns. But at the same time, deep learning will also take a long time if there's that many columns. So it doesn't really matter. You can run all of these in the time that you run a deep learning model, roughly. Deep learning can be faster or can be slower. There's a lot of ways to make deep learning slower than all the other models. But there's also a lot of ways to make it faster. It depends on the number of neurons and those weights, as I mentioned earlier. If you have one hidden neuron, the model is going to be really fast. So let's run the default. That's 200, 200. I call it I feel lucky model. It's just you say go. Then there's the 512. That's the eagle eye, right? Sharp vision. Then there's the one with three layers, something like a puppy brain. It's, it's still not quite that sharp and all, but it learned some tricks. And then there's the one with five layers, but maybe less neurons in each layer, just to see that it's like uh, converging or not. You want to get an idea what happens when you do these different types of networks. Should it be really contorted, the logic, or should it be all straight and sharp? Every time you run the model, 
you either just wait and see until the end, or you actually want to get an intuition, right? How, how do they behave? You can run a model and look at it at the same time. As I showed you in the demos, you just say, get model, and then you type the model ID. And I usually name my models. I call it DL, uh, whatever, fast or quick or something. And then I have my model. In this case, I called it DL regular. And you see that I looked at it, at it as it was at 14% progress. And I see already an output scoring history. Um, I see the network architecture. I see that it's predicting C1, that it's a two-class classification problem. I see all these things. I see how many samples have been trained, how many epochs, how fast it is at training. All these things come out of the user interface. And you don't see that from R or Python or through a REST call. You only see it at the end. Most tools actually in the world today, when you run a model, you only at the end see how it performed and how fast it was. You have no idea. In H2O, you do get that real-time feedback. So that's very valuable. And this early stopping I mentioned earlier, definitely use that. It's on by default for deep learning. It's not on by default for GBM and random forest. So there you can turn it on yourself. For deep learning, it matters a lot. In the left uh, plot, you can see that the validation error, of course, um, bottomed out somewhere very early, and then it overfit. The training error kept going down, but that's no good because you're not going to use that model on the training data later. You're going to use it on the validation data or something like that, the same distribution as your holdout, hopefully, or something like that, right? You don't want to overfit on just the training data. So what you do is you do early stopping. You get the best model that you got in the early phases of the model building, and it will go to the best model it's ever seen if you have the flag on that's called override with best model. That's on by default. So if you provide a validation set, it will be used to do this early stopping. And you can say you want to stop and the AUC doesn't improve anymore by, let's say, more than 5% over five consecutive um, scoring events. Or you can say log loss or classification error, whatever you want. You can specify the number R squared, mean square error, Anything you want, any reasonable metric that we have implemented, you can stop on. And it's using a moving average to um, compute that. So it's not just using these noisy um, last scoring events, but a moving average over a window that's as long as the consecutive number of scoring events. So if you say I want for 10 events it to be improving by at least 3%, then it uses a 10 long window for the moving average for both the value before that window and after, like in those 10. It's like all sliding windows. Now the question is, what's that number on the validation set that you're looking at to do this early stopping, right? How do you know how good you are? Well, you have to score it on this validation set. But what if that validation set is 2 billion rows and your training set is the other 8 billion rows? Well, then you have to train on the training data for like hours and hours, and then you score on these two billion rows every time just to see how good you're doing, or how well you're doing. No, you're not. You're not necessarily supposed to do that, right? You're just trying to see how well is it converging. So what you do is you specify a score validation samples parameter to be less than the two billion. By default, it uses the entire validation set because I trust your instinct in giving me a validation set, but in reality, it's actually using the number that you specify there. So you can say sample it down to 50,000 rows and then look at that. That's my, that might be good enough because when you, when you score all the time, you don't want to score on the full data. You can also say how often you should score, how many seconds in between scoring, what's the duty cycle of scoring. You can say don't spend more than 5% on scoring and so on. So this is an important thing for production use because you don't want to waste time on scoring. By default, it only does 10% of the time anyway. Cross-validation is important, as we mentioned many times before, especially with early stopping. So if you do early stopping and cross-validation, the model you're getting back has already tuned this number of epochs for you. So you'll get the best number of epochs that was determined by those and other cross-validation models. And you get the metric back that says how well your model would be doing on internal validation. So it's a fair estimate of the model performance on um, the holdout data that it's, it, that it's the training data itself. That's called cross-validation. But you're getting a model that was trained on all your data, so you get all benefits at once. Now, regularization is important. If you don't turn on regularization, then you see this overfitting that I mentioned earlier. 
And if you do tunnel regularization in terms of like L1 penalty, L2 penalty, or dropout, then you see this, this, these flatlining curves. But the question is not what's flat. The question is where is the validation error low, right? But there's like a balance between the two. So in, on, in this case, both are similar in performance. The one on the right side is slightly better. It's 0.183 uh, or so. But you have to tune these models. Just be aware that you don't want to overfit too much. Generalization is what you want. Now, hyperparameter search is something you definitely want to try with deep learning. I don't necessarily recommend grid search, because grid search says try all these with all these with all these. It's a Cartesian product, and it blows up, right? There's too many combinations. So what you really want to do is you want to sample, let's say, 50 times in this 20-dimensional space and just throw 20 darts into this universe of parameters and see which one is the best. You only need to find one or two good models out of all good models. If you think about all possible models that could be trained, there's a lot of models that are similar. You don't have to find the best one. There isn't such a thing as the best anyway. So try to do these um, different options here and just change those parameters. These are the main parameters to tune. The learning rate you can tune if, if you want to tweak performance a little bit faster um, than letting the adaptive learning rate do its thing. But typically, adaptive is fine. Now, checkpointing is the thing that's key to not doing the same thing over and over. You can build the first two hours of your model one time, then save that, and then continue 50 more models from this checkpoint, and you just do different things. You can add regularization at that point, so your model, whatever it was, will then change again. That's the nature of online training. You can add L1 penalty at any time. You can change the dropout rate at any time. You cannot change the activation function. You cannot change the number of neurons. Certain things you cannot change, and the model will tell you so. But you can try to change everything else that makes sense. So regularization, especially, is one of the things you're allowed to change. So at the end, you have 50 models that have different regularization strength, and they will then end up at different places in the end. This is for multi-node users. If you have a Hadoop cluster with like 10 nodes or something, or 20 nodes, you have to know that they have to talk to each other, right? And they have to all train in parallel, and they have to talk to each other to make a better overall model, and then they have to train again, and then to talk again. And this ratio between training and communication, you can turn as well. There's a knob for that. So it, by default, it's 5% on communication and 95% on computation. And of course, your data, as I mentioned earlier, if you have too many categoricals, like zip codes, you add 50,000 more categoricals, 50,000 more neurons in the beginning, it makes it way too slow. So what you do is you take either a different deep learning model to reduce the dimensionality. You can extract those inner features with the h2.deep features call, or you just use another method like GLRM to project down this high dimensional space of categoricals into a low dimensional dense numerical space. And we will provide you with examples. Of course, if you're an insurance expert, you will use Tweedy or Poisson or Gamma. If you want to know how many claims are made or what's the claim size and so on. So you definitely want to know your math. You use offsets. You use uh, observation weights, all that. It's all implemented in H2O Deep Learning. And the last point I want to make is ensembling. You heard Aaron's great talk yesterday. Ensembles are awesome, and deep learning is a good member of ensembles because it's so different than a tree, right? It doesn't just cut up the space. It actually makes these nonlinear features. So throw them all together. Either you blend them, just have a weight for each model, or you make this stacking where you have predictions made by each model and then another model on top that then blends those together on a row-per-row -row basis. And the worst case, you just take five deep learning models and average them. That always works. All right, great. I hope this helps you, and uh, talk to you later. Thank you. And we have time for about four minutes of Q&A. So Got if you have any questions, please raise your hands, and our volunteers We've got time for two or three questions. Uh, my question is how you can uh, apply the, the deep learning on the time series data. So the question was, how do we do this for time series? So that's a good question. And typically, what people do is they transpose the data. So they find, they find um, let's say, the last 1,000 events and make that into a row. And then they shift it and then offset that window by one time step. And they make 
another row that's the next thousand shifted by one, and then the next thousand, next thousand, next thousand, and all of these thousand long rows represent a sequence over a thousand time steps, let's say, but shifted by one. The starting point is a different one, but they still have a thousand um, events per, per row. And then you say, okay, this event was a good one or a bad one or something or whatever happened. And that's kind of the way people do it. But there's definitely other ways to do it. You can make new uh, um, aggregates, like you can compute how many times did this happen and this happened at the time and so on. So you make new features and you feed the deep learning model that. You don't want to have it figure out everything. Now, ideally, you want to use recurrent neural nets for, for sequence learning, but h does not have that right now. It's, it's very CPU intense, so you'd better be off uh, using GPUs. And we will consider doing that ourselves. So it's on the roadmap is to, to um, identify ways to make this whole ecosystem work well with uh, the state-of-the-art sequence learning methods out there. Right over here. Howdy. Uh, do you have any comments about using nets for like really unbalanced data sets with really rare labels or other like anomaly detection kinds of things? So we, we do have a balanced classes option right here that balances the classes, and then you get a even distribution. But ov obviously, that's oversampling and undersampling. So you don't necessarily see new data. You just create duplicates of the minority classes, or you downsample the majority classes to have a balance. And deep learning can benefit a little bit of that. Um, I would say if it's totally imbalanced, that's hard. And you will have to do your other feature engineering first to somehow get some better signal-to-noise ratio. Deep learning itself is rel relatively noisy, right? So you're not going to be lucky telling that little brain to like figure it out itself. And there's there's definitely ways to do it better than just raw over and under sampling. For anomaly detection, you can use the unsupervised mode of deep learning where you do um, just auto encoders where you learn the structure of the data. You throw all the the good points in. And then you throw in the bad point and, and realize that the reconstruction error is so big that it doesn't fit that idea of a good point. So that might then tell you, OK, this is really a bad point. But the, the method basically will just say it either fits my model of reality or not, and by how much it doesn't fit. But I don't think that deep learning autoencoder is necessarily the best anomaly detection tool. It's just one method in there. And we've used it successfully for simple stuff like MNIST but um, I'm not an expert in the field of anomaly detection by no means. Do I see a hand over there? Oh, this way. Up here. So the last question. I have a question regarding like uh, using the dropout and the rectifier. So if I define like as a, my activation function is a rectifier and I provided the deep learning like hidden dropout ratio, what it will perform there? Will it be a rectifier with dropout? Sorry, you provided rectifier? In yeah, as an activation function. Yes, and, and what else? I, I gave it also hidden uh, dropout ratios. Oh, and if you just do a rectifier and hidden dropout ratios, it will print in the logs warning ignored. So you have to do rectify with dropout, and only that will then enable you to specify the hidden dropout ratios. However, the input dropout you can do with any activation function, so you don't have to toggle between rectify or rectify with dropout. The input dropout is always allowed to set. So the only reason we have these two rectifier and rectify with dropout is to have you not worry about that uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 default setting for all the layers. So you just say rectify with dropout, and it automatically uses 0 0.5 dropout on each hidden layer. It's more a convenience for the user, especially because we don't know a priori how many uh, hidden layers you will have and all that. We can't just say the default is this for hidden dropout ratios. We don't know how many layers you have. So it's more like a a workaround to be able to set those default values for you internally. So it's a convenience function. But the best you can do is always use hidden, uh, the, the rectifier with dropout and just set the hidden dropout ratios yourself to either zero or non-zero. Thank you, Arno. All right, thank you. <laughs>